Hello everyone and welcome back to our special series of Project Nisei board member interviews. This is session five in that Hello series. Hello everyone and, oh, and I'm getting my own audio special looping. series Give me one second. of Project Nisei. There we go. Um, yeah, we're on episode five of this series and I just kind of stuttered myself because my audio was playing. But um, with me is Project Nisei Rules Manager, Jacob Morris. So I'm very excited to have you with us, Jacob. I'm very excited to be here. It's, um, you're somebody that's been a part of the community a really long time, but I feel like a lot of my viewers may not be familiar with you, despite you being very critical in of Netrunner over its history. So why don't we talk a little bit about your Netrunner story, how you got into the game, and what you were doing before being on the Nisei board. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been playing Netrunner for just about uh, right after the core release. Um, as I'm sure will feel pretty familiar to a lot of Netrunner players, uh, I was out of Magic for a really long time, and some friends and I were playing it again, maybe a little bit, thinking about buying into Standard, and a friend of mine was like, I don't, I want to get back into that. That's just a huge money sink, and it's not even really that fun. So he told me about this new game he found out about called Netrunner, which the premise right away was really interesting to me. And then he told me it was a living card game uh, instead of a trading card game. And so I remember looking up Fantasy Flight's website and being like, okay, what is this? Uh, this doesn't even look like a real company. I don't know if I want to buy into this right now. Then little did uh, you know how to... No, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. But yeah, I mean, uh, uh, but compa I mean, that's a good point, though. Like, in the industry... You know, when you talk about, like, budgeting, web presence, like, nobody mm -hmm. can hold a candle to Wizards. They're just, like, a, this huge titan compared to everybody. Exactly. Um, and I, I hadn't played or at least been to the websites for more than just, like, Magic and Pokemon before. So, like, that was kind of my point of comparison. And since then, I've looked at some other trading card games, and, like, they look, they look like Netrunner used to. It was just, like... You know, so that's at the time I was unimpressed, but then we played the game. He actually got it for me for my birthday, um, which is in December. So, like, it had like just come out. Um, and we played it literally all day, just trying to learn the ins and outs, trying each of the decks. Um, and we were pretty much instantly hooked. Like, later that week, I, I think it was uh, like payday that happened to be that week so i just like went and immediately bought all three data packs that had been out for both of us and two more core sets <laughs> yeah i mean um that's a similar story to a lot of people is if the yep. if the if the bomb goes off in your brain then you're just like hooked yep absolutely and i've i've often heard it considered and I considered it myself um to be basically like game designer catnip and at the time, I was actually working in video games, and it, that very much held true for me. So pretty much immediately, I was hooked not just on like, the game itself, but also the core rules and the systems and like everything about it that made it so brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to um, me a little bit about, you know, that's how you started playing, but mm -hmm. what is kind of some of the big community contributions that you've made? Because you've made some pretty significant ones in my opinion um and it's Thanks. some things that i'm aware of and some people mm -hmm. who are you know more kind of living that day-to-day -day in the competitive deck building world um are probably going to be more familiar with it but we're trying to get these videos out to everybody so tell people about totally. what you were working on before being on the board of project nisa yeah so once I started playing, like I said, I was pretty much immediately hooked on like the rules and um, just the core systems. So like I played casually for a little while, and then I started going to tournaments a little bit. Um, and I never had like any huge 
competitive placements, like maybe second at regionals at one point or something. Um, probably the thing I'm most infamous for is um, the Butcher Shop deck. But um, after that, uh, I noticed, like, just over time as I started to, instead of playing at tournaments, running tournaments, I noticed that it was just really hard running tournaments because the rules were just so inconsistent. You had to kind of, like, follow the designers on Twitter to, like, really even, like, know a lot of the ins and outs for some of the more complicated interactions that you don't really notice right away until you start your own deck building or you go to a tournament and, like, now you're playing with maybe cards you're not familiar with and um, you start to notice these weird interactions. But, um, like, early on in the game, there wasn't really any good way except for, like, going on message boards, I guess, really, to, like, know how to resolve those issues. So... And I think, and I think Netrunner is a unique game in that regard, right? Um, yeah. A lot of other card games have very streamlined, like when you can play actions situations, yep. right? Of when you mm -hmm. can fire abilities, where it's just like, okay, I'm about to do a thing. Do you have an instant or a reaction? No. Okay, we yep. continue. But with the timing exactly. structure of a run, the way Netrunner is laid out. There's so many mm -hmm. cascading triggers that can happen that you just don't see in other games. Exactly. So um, right around like a year or two in, I started just constantly pestering Lucas, the designer at the time, on Twitter, just like asking him all kinds of questions. Um, I wrote him like, I don't know, a dozen emails, <laughs> um, just like really hammering in on some of the core systems of the game uh, because what I was trying to do at the time was essentially create a wiki that would have um, just like a bunch of cross-reference articles on all the subjects about the game um, and its rules and how to interact with the cards and like pulling all the rulings from all of uh, from from Lucas himself um, putting them into one place so that people had that as a resource and that's how that's kind of how uh, ANCR or Anchor started, which was just literally that as a website. And so I did that for basically since then. I've been kind of collating rulings and stuff. And but I think, but it's uh, more. It's more than that. I mean, I think a big part of what you did um, and continue to do is, you know. Um, and especially now going forward, but we'll talk about that. Um, yeah. You know, FFG being a, well, they ended up becoming a more medium-sized company mm -hmm. from a smaller company during uh, Netrunner's tenure. But yeah. they don't move quick, right? They don't, exactly. they, nev they never have, right? So without people like you going on Twitter and being like, yo, like Lucas... When somebody does this, when they have this card out, like, which one of these resolves first? You know, like, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Like, we would be waiting months on what could be, like, very serious, like, tournament deciding questions or clarification questions that basically decide whether or not cards are playable or not. Because if nobody knows yeah. how to interpret them, they functionally exactly. can't be played. Yep. There are a lot of things like that. Um, and a lot of times, too, where, like, someone would post... Like, we'd email him and post a ruling um, from... or Because the email doesn't necessarily go directly to him. You can go on Fantasy Flight's website and, like... Shoot an email to some question. random employee. Yeah, yeah and who knows even is going to answer it. Um, and you get back a, a, an answer from, from a form there that just, like, didn't make sense. And then having to wrangle a, another answer out of somebody else, right? Like, the... the not, a lot, not everybody had to deal with that issue, but anybody who did like knew how messy it can be because like you look at any other game like magic as kind of a common comparison they have a giant uh rules document that you can answer almost any question right, right. like there, there's always going to be a definitive answer and maybe they'll change it down the line because they'll realize it's not what they wanted the answer to be but at least there's always an answer i mean i remember just as an example of um you know, um, not that this has ever been an incredible card, but dedicated response <laughs> team. In year one, we were waiting for a ruling 
on whether or not the runner had a jackout window after you res that car. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. when at the end of like year one where they were like, no, there's a phase where you ask the runner if they want to continue the run and make it successful. And then you have one last window to res things yeah. and they can't jack out. And that like was game changing for like 10 cards because previous people would be <laughs> like, oh, if you res that, I'm going to jack out. Yep. Yeah. But yeah. So on the note, on the note of cards, you're somebody who's obviously spent a lot of time thinking about cards and thinking about mm -hmm. how they interact with each other. Do you have a favorite corp and runner card? Hmm. Doesn't have to necessarily be for mechanical reasons, but it could be, of course. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say like most of my favorite cards are the ones that aren't messy rules wise, <laughs> uh, just because those are the ones you don't have to think about as much. And I think that's really like what makes a card well designed often. Um, but I am a total degenerate, and my favorite cards are Astro Script and Account Siphon. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking yeah, about. I think no. I think we've got like two out of five or three out of five account siphons. Mm -hmm. People miss that card, man. Bring it back. High profile it's target will keep people in in check now. Exactly. Um, yeah. um I I don't think Astro Script should have existed, but I sure did love playing with it. <laughs> I, I I remember it's funny that people often mention those two cards in comparison because I was looking at my old Temple NEH back when you could have mm -hmm. Breaking News and Sand Sand City Grids yep. and Team Sponsorship and Biotic right and Shipments yep. and I was like how did I ever lose with this deck where you could like chain <laughs> Astros and then I was like oh right Account Siphon existed because like exactly. you would just get yeah. siphoned to the dirt and never be able to do anything exactly but yeah so We've talked a little bit about what you've done in the past. So tell me a mm -hmm. little bit more about what you're going to be doing for the Nisei board going forward and how that's going to change and expand maybe what you've already been doing. Sure. Um, so as kind of a little bit more of a backdrop to this work, um, once I actually put together the rules wiki for Netrunner, um, Lucas ended up reaching out to me and basically hiring me to edit all the cards to kind of head, head off some of the problems that they were seeing with rulings and stuff, try to kind of um, stop the questions from happening in the first place, but kind of just making the cards a little bit more clear, a little bit more consistent. Um, and then through that contact, doing that work for a little bit of time, I was eventually able to convince him that we should release basically um, set notes like release notes for all of the packs that came out. Um, so that's how the unofficial facts came about. Um, just kind of giving answers to not just making sure the cards are a little bit clearer when they come out, but also ha making sure some of the questions people might have are answered before they get asked in the first place. Right. Um, so that's kind of probably my most visible work are the U facts and now that we're going into a community-driven game, that's going to be another huge thing that we're going to be continuing on, is tightening up the card text, tightening up the rules text, and making sure that there are accessible and widely available rules resources every time new cards come out. Um, so it's, it, in a lot of ways, it's actually going to feel very similar for a lot of people to what uh, was happening before pretty much because um, there's going to be uh, that continuing process going forward. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, I think there's going to be a lot of that. So um, what is a way that you're going to, you you know, obviously some of the things that you're working on are still in kind of their mm -hmm. infant stages. Things are uh, being actively worked on but aren't really, you know, all finished yet. But, um, you know, is there anything that you're working on? What can the community kind of expect from where you're going to take your work now that, you know, you're in more of a lead, direct leadership role, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed, like, you're the authority now. You're no, you're no yeah. longer collecting information from the authority. You're the authority yep. now. 
Um, so a big, like our first thing that we're going to announce on the 26th, right after day zero, the biggest thing we're going to be doing, minor spoilers, is completely revamp, revamping and reformatting how rules are presented for Netrunner. Um, so right now we have this sort of alphabetical glossary of perhaps pertinent topics, essentially. Um, known as the rules reference. Very hard to read. It is very, very hard to read. Uh, if you have a question about how abilities resolve, like, I don't know, look in at least five different places, maybe. <laughs> um, just to try and figure it out, because maybe it's not even related to abilities, but like the cost of that ability, right? Um, so what we're, what we're going to be releasing instead is, is something that's essentially more topic-driven, um, more kind of topic-oriented. Um, so instead of being alphabetical, there's going to be, you know, a section for all the key concepts in the game. A section that's here's everything about abilities, and then a yeah. section that's here's everything about like, runs. Like a paid ability window. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, I, th I think that's really important, because again, um, a lot of other card games, and I've, you know, I played Magic in the past, I played Pokemon mm -hmm. when I was younger, you know... Yep. I'm not saying that Netrunner has a monopoly on complicated rules. But what I am <laughs> saying is, sure. is Netrunner's rules are in motion in a way that a lot of other mm -hmm. card games don't have. Where you can end up getting in these really weird interactional spaces. Where you're yeah. engaging multiple rules in a way that you don't see in more templated games. Or games yeah. that don't have something where you're doing something in a weird visualized space as opposed to being like a dude basher. Well, a lot of a lot of those games also have a very like um, procedural sequence to them, right? Where you go from this phase to this phase to this phase and each thing, you know, there's only really one step at a time. Whereas in Netrunner, you have a lot more sort of... Um, right, your turn is your turn. Free space. Yeah, right. exactly. You just do what you want to do, right? So that, that creates a lot of issues. And there's a lot of things about Netrunner's rules that are very clever once you get to know how they work because there's a lot of really subtle distinctions between, um, you know, even, for example, one of the best examples is, like, how, uh, where in a sentence the word if appears can change how the ability functions entirely. Or, or, and it's or, very or if there's a comma or a period. Exactly, yeah. Um, and and once you know all those like sort of little distinctions, it's very interesting and actually quite unique to Netrunner. But a lot of those don't really serve the player base from a complexity standpoint. Right. Like it the... makes the game very opaque. I remember it took exactly. like three or four games for me to get my brother to really understand. He plays a lot of Magic with his sons, mm -hmm. and then once like in the halfway through game two, where he was just like, oh literally everything's a resource in this game yeah yeah and um you know he had never dealt with that before because in magic which is a very well designed game um the only resource you really manage are is your hand how many options mm -hmm. you have available to you and your mana yeah but you're those are the only limiting factors so if you can do some crazy bananas turn you can do some crazy bananas turn Whereas in Netrunner, everything that you would use to do something is another expendable resources that either takes time to regenerate or you only get a set amount of each turn. Yep. Or even each game. Or even each game, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so just kind of to touch back on your question again, uh, looking forward to what people can expect. That's like the first thing we're going to do, but we don't really want to rock the boat too much right away. Um, just from the perspective of we don't want to like a lot of the rules changes we want to consider or at least leave on the table could possibly change how certain cards work and we didn't want to like really inundate the game with a lot of changes all at once sure um, but looking forward we're going to be looking a lot at how we can simplify things down a lot and maybe even like maybe even change how some cards work because if it's better for the game easier to learn um, and easier to to perform as you're playing at a tournament or whatever, then that's that's something I think um, you, you basically need to figure out what kind of complexity is worth trading for for for, for a other play types of experience. Yeah. yeah, exactly. 
Yeah. So like go going forward, we're definitely going to be examining a lot of hot topics. Like, do we need the no change in game state rule? Um, do we really need the distinction between the ordering on which uh, words appear on cards? And a big part of that is why I actually hired or hired um, added on my team uh, another editor, uh, Kaylee Amon, because. Um, as we make those changes going forward, we want to make sure that the cards themselves also are just much clearer, and you don't have to look up the rules necessarily, right? That's right. Kind of the idea. Yeah, I gotcha. I think that's I think that's wise. So mm -hmm. let's ask another current card pool question of you, Jacob. Okay. So what makes an ID fun for you? And give us an example of an ID that you really enjoy. Uh, all right. Um, I would definitely say that one of my all-time favorite and most fun IDs is definitely Leela Patel. Um, yeah. I, I really like IDs that, first of all, are relevant. I like the ones that, as you play the game, there's something you have to think around from both sides of the table. Um, but I don't like them to be really efficient. I prefer splashy things. So I really like Leela because she only happens, you know, maybe, um, you know, three to six times a game. But when she happens... It's really impactful. Um, it's really interesting, yeah. And and the reason she happens not very often is because people are playing around what's going to happen when she goes off, right? So I, I find that sort of thing. It's the same reason why I really like... Um, Petzl, for example, is because she changes the game so much you have to think about uh, what's going to happen when you can break barriers, that you change how you play ice, you change how, um, you know, which ice you res and stuff like that. So when, when, when those, those kinds of abilities happen, when it, when, it, when it can be really pivotal, I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I, I think that that's cool. So on that note, is there an identity that you enjoy or you thought was a cool concept that really didn't hit the ground running that you maybe expected to make more of a splash in the the card pool than it did yeah i'm gonna sound i'm actually more of a court player myself i guess but i so i'm mostly talking about runner cards um i actually really really am sad that kit never really worked out as amazing as i would have hoped um she is the same kind of thing, right? She's messing with ice. You have to think about how you're how you're playing against her from the other side of the table, um, but it just never ends up actually being that pivotal often enough, I guess. I think I think yeah, I think the ten in, it's the ten influence because yeah. the ten influence she just um, can't get enough money generation going. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Exactly. Like that's always what it comes down to. But yeah, so. <clears throat> Obviously, you know, we've already touched on that you've done some of the kinds of work that you're going to be doing for the board mm -hmm. for a long time. But, you know, what kind of drew you to the board taking on this more expanded role? What's the thing that you're most excited about? Um, I guess that's kind of two questions in one. Um, yeah, let's do it one part I guess at a time. What, what, drew yeah. you, what drew you to the position? Um, well, uh, I think what threw me to the position was just, I guess, that I kind of already have been doing that work, and I love Netrunner so much, and I love the community so much, like, that's what I've always done the work for. Um, like, literally most, most if not all of my favorite moments from Netrunner were from being a judge at an event doing the rule stuff for people, watching them have a good time, helping people have fun at the event. Um, and I just, I didn't want that to go away. Um, I think even until Worlds at Magnum Opus earlier this year, I didn't really even feel like FFG's ended support was kind of real yet. Right. So I really wanted a way to kind of focus on that without really having to think about it i guess yeah that makes um, sense yeah so so i, I, mean, I, I, I feel really like a lot of us were in that boat yeah yeah absolutely it was so, definitely an emotional event yeah i mean 
I think the vibe was very positive overall, though. People were amped to be there and amped yeah. to see everybody. Absolutely. Which is a big part of, you know, every single one of these interviews, we've come back to this idea of being at events, competitive or otherwise, and being yeah. able to spend this time with people is why everybody is drawn to the board. So when you think about the work that you have in store, you know, you've teased a little bit about that. But, you know, what's what's firing you up to do your work as a board member of Nisei? What are you excited <laughs> about moving forward? I think the uh, thing I'm most excited about is just being able to try new things and focus on um, certain aspects of the game that FFG was just, um, I mean, they were amazing wardens of the game, very happy with, with the game as they're leaving it, uh, but things that they were just maybe too slow to like try and address. Um, you know, Can you give an example? Like what we were talking about before. So like, for example, a big thing that um, I feel like they never really took the time to address and maybe they just couldn't because, you know, um, up higher ups, you know, corporate shenanigans or whatever. Um, but for example, on the last rules reference update, they actually took out derived information. And that has a lot of huge implications, not just from a rules perspective, but also from an accessibility perspective. And I think there's a lot more that can be done with the rules to make the game more about skill than about um, memory. These, like, than memory or like, uh, there, like, there's a lot of different types of memory involved, obviously, but like making it more about a game of skill than a game of enchants, obviously, because we all like that a little bit too. Um, but, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of accessibility concerns from from that perspective that I think can be addressed um, really carefully and really cleverly if we if we put our, our minds to it. Yeah. And I think expanding the game to make it, because it's not just about accessibility of new players, but like accessibility of just that, that mental strain of playing the game. Yeah, I mean, and I think, I think all of you have already done a, a, a pretty good job of making yourselves accessible in a way that, you know, for various reasons, corporate, legal issues, the people that were previously, as you said, the wardens of Netrunner, were not able to be, right? Mm -hmm. they, it's, it's difficult for um, a Lucas, a Boggs, a Damon Stone to be that level of accessible. Yeah. You know, yeah. especially with you in this position, you know, you already have a lot more experience being very accessible to the community. Yeah. I think that's a big part of why the community is so strong and why I have a lot of hope for for the future is that these are now, now that it's no longer the people up in their tower giving us this game and it's us keeping it alive ourselves, we all know each other and we all want to know everyone else out there who doesn't know us yet who plays this game with us, right? Um, so just being already an active part of the community and spreading that work out among, you know, a lot of enough people means that we can all give it a lot more love than than just like one or two or three people at a time can give. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about the Netrunner community because I think you're going to have some really interesting stories. Do you have any kind of favorite, do you have a favorite moment or moments from being involved in the community thus far? Uh, I think... It's not really like any one single moment, but just the feeling of community that Netrunner has. Um, at the at the time that uh, I started playing Netrunner, um, at least well, actually a few years in, um, I actually went through a really bad. I don't want to like obviously get into all of it, but I was going through some really bad times and just being a part of the community that is so welcoming really kind of turned my life around. And one of the other things that the community has done for me that I would never have really even seen coming was actually teach me so much more about um, just my place in the world and how much variety of 
human experiences there are out there. Um, I never really got out of the house that much until I started playing the game. And this community kind of brought me out of my shell in that sense. That's really um, lovely. Yeah, so like, I guess some of the, um, like one of the, the most memorable moments was Gen Con a few years ago. Um, I came out and the Gen Con, because FFG invited me and like judged um, nationals or whatever. And then like kind of only really met people in passing because it was a big convention. Um, and then going to Worlds the same year because uh, FFG invited me just the fact that I'd only ever really sort of met any of those people in passing and then at Worlds, everyone treated me like we were all close friends. Like just that aspect of the community has always blown my mind. Yeah, that it was a it was a wild scene this year too. You know, like yeah. seeing everybody like, I mean, I see Dan D more frequently because he's up in Philly, but you know, seeing everybody sure. And like Dean and like everybody and everybody is just like, Dan, you know, how's it going? So great to see you. Yeah. And these are people that I only really interact with on the internet primarily, you know, and these are yeah, people. Yeah, the internet primarily. Yeah. And it's just wild. Um, and that's obviously what we want to keep going. Um, yep, exactly. Somebody from um, Jesse Turner from Terminal 7's the Vancouver meta. Mm -hmm. said this incredible thing at Magnum Opus where it was talking about Netrunner and being part of the Netrunner community is the reward for learning Netrunner. Yeah. Uh, and like uh, that very, really very stuck with me. But yeah. So yeah. that's 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 one of the saddest parts that I've always found of like trying to teach the game and trying to um get new players in, they look at it and it's really complicated, obviously, so they don't get really interested. And I just want to tell them, like, no, it's not, that's not really, like, I know it's complicated, but that's not the why it matters, you know? <laughs> like, we're not playing it because it's a fun game, even though it is, obviously, like, when you get past that, but yeah, once you get past this gate, the rest of it's the good part, like, the, all the people you'll know. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. Like, yeah. I think about how much I've learned um, from other people playing this game and how much people have helped me, you know, just to kind of echo what you said, become um, more of myself, better version mm -hmm. of myself, more knowledgeable about the world and other people's experiences just by being connected to all these people who otherwise living in, you know, kind of middle rural Delaware, I would never know any of these people. Yeah, exactly. I, I, a lot of people up here in the Pacific Northwest, especially in Seattle, like to pretend that it's a very progressive city. But um, my experience up until Netrunner was very much privileged cis white male, just because those are the types of people that I worked with in video games and saw most of the time. But then playing Netrunner, I met so many other different types of people online and in person that that really just opened up my eyes and I, I it's one of the many one of the like handful of things that actually made me more socially conscious and aware and yeah. i think that's a really beautiful thing about netrunner because of how how i mean i think it's a lot about the setting but uh, also about the people who play it yeah absolutely so going forward you know, the focus ultimately of the Nisei board is to preserve and expand and grow and improve upon all of this community and this game that has been built. So when you mm -hmm. think about the future, let's talk specifically about what do you think some of the challenges that we're going to face inside your specific sphere of managing the rules going forward? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I'm going to run into as a challenge is, uh, and I think this is something that FFG also struggled with, is just accessibility of the rules um, and uh, where you can find those that, that information. Um, so I think we're going to really face a problem, especially now that it is community driven, people are going to look up Netrunner on the internet, right, and try to be interested in this game, like that's um, not officially supported anymore, and how are they going to find out how to even play the game? That's right. going to be a really huge issue. 
because it's not like we can just um, package up a rule book and some cards and sell it to you, right? Um, and that has a rule book that'll teach you how to play the game. So I think a uh, big part of what actually I'm going to face as a as a as the rules manager is um, pretty much running, uh, working very carefully and closely with RC on community management because we're going to need to find a way to work together to make sure that those rules are there and presentable and there's like a really clear onboarding sure. um, for new players. Yeah. 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 There's some things uh, off camera I want to discuss with you about that because I have um, things that I think myself and other con content creators who are willing to volunteer their time could assist in that. But we could talk about that more off camera. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, but, you know, we've discussed with pre the previous Nisei board guests, obviously there's volunteer positions available with Nisei. But in addition, talk let's talk a little bit about those volunteer positions and also other ways that the community can help you with your specific mm -hmm. tasks that you're undertaking. Sure. Um... I think the biggest thing people can do is um, continuing to participate as much as they have been, um, not just with um, like content and stuff like that, but um, Netrunner actually has a pretty lively um, community of rules aficionados. And there are, there's a lot of times you'll see like people post on the Facebook or the Reddit or whatever questions for rules. And they get you know answers really fast, or like more questions about like oh I don't really know the answer, or like you know reach out to me and ask for an answer to that question. And I think keeping that conversation going is one of the most important things. Talk to me on Twitter, tweet it us at um, uh, ANR Rules Wiki on tw on Twitter. You know like ask us your questions. We need to know what people are confused about out there so that we can make sure and address those issues. Um, especially for new players and entrenched players alike. Um, so keeping that going is really important because we want to create a community that can, you know, answer each other's questions. I think that's really what is going to be what success looks like for my job is when I'm not necessarily the one answering questions for people anymore right when you're, when you're able it's to when, empower other people to feel exactly. comfortable answering those questions exactly yeah i like that yeah and i think i think um you know since we've always always had basically grassroots judging especially at least yep. for um you know g and k's regionals etc mm -hmm. um i think we can continue that um yep. people can stay engaged and I think the other thing that, you know, I know you've mentioned in the past and other people affiliated with the game has mentioned, you know, you don't have to be a rules wizard to be a great judge, you know? Yeah. You just have to be willing to take the time to be thoughtful and find the correct information. Exactly. And I think that's something else that uh, I'm not going to, like, commit to, but wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I think um, judge resources is definitely something that myself and a couple other board members are, are very interested in expanding in the future. That's great. That's, yeah, I think that's fantastic. So if you could bring one card back from rotation, only one, what would it be? Hmm. Hmm. That's tricky because I know the people who are in charge of that. Um, one card back from rotation. You don't have to answer this with a thought to game balance. You can answer it yeah. out of your heart. Okay. Of what you would want. Um, I think, honestly... Yeah, with, without consideration to any kind of balance, like you said, I think I really want Stan Sense City Grid back, actually. I miss that card a lot. Um, I miss that card so much. I thought it was one of the most interestingly versatile 
cards from the corpse side, especially in like an account siphon in vamp meta where it's like, I can res this to spend some of my credits, right? Or right. I can res, uh, res it to force the runner to have to come and trash my stuff. Or I leave it on the board and maybe they see one in R&D, right? Like, I, I just, I love that card so much. And I think that having a variety of fast advance tools is actually really interesting and important for the game to be yeah fun I, yeah, yeah i agreed and um you know obviously account siphon doesn't still exist um yeah <laughs> but um i think about that when i play criminal and i watch people like res like one or two things but it's just like you know rashida doesn't cost any money ashes no. too so like people don't really have the ability to dump credits like they did now, cred mm-hmm. denial isn't nearly as strong as it was. You're not frequently yep. getting brought down to zero dollars. But it's just yep. interesting that we used to be in this meta where it'd be like, okay, I'm going to siphon you, and you're like, dump everything. You know what I'm saying? And you just <laughs> like throw all this money into these upgrades and these assets, and suddenly all your money's gone. Yeah, there was a very brief and hilarious moment, I remember, very early on in Genesis, where it was like Draco was an amazing piece of ice because when you res it, you're like, oh, Put it on HQ. If they account siphon me, all Just, my money is in the stupid strong ice. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, either make it super big or just be like, I'm gonna pour, you know, six credits yeah. into this trace. Exactly. But yeah, that, that was maybe like two weeks. I don't know, but it was Gosh, still Draco. Yeah, that's <laughs> my answer to that question is noise. But noise would be an absolute nightmare engine. No. No, yeah. I hate you. He's I so, hate noise. Can imagine, imagine noise plus Yusuf. Yeah, that uh, sounds awful. <laughs> so good, but yeah. Um, so before we let you go tonight, Jacob, can do you have any plugs or announcements you want to make? Any any more teasers you want to drop on our viewers <laughs> before we go? Um. Oh, where, where can people find you and you mentioned it briefly where can people find you and your work uh thus far yeah so uh i don't have any more teasers yet because i don't have anything super exciting um other than what i've kind of sprinkled throughout the interview um but i do i do want to reiterate that you can um find a lot of what we're what i have done in the past on netrunner db Every time you look at a card page, um, you can see the facts and rulings um, for those cards up on there. And we're going to be looking to expand that going forward. We're going to try and migrate everything relevant to a card on those pages if we can. Nice. Um, and so I, I, I'm saying that mostly because I'm loath to send people to the wiki. It's just like really unreadable. It hits horrible. Not my best work. Um, and please also reach out again, like I said, to us on Twitter. It's just at, um, uh, uh, Netrunner Rules Wiki. And it's, um, where you can find us and where you can tweet at us. Nisei, um, I actually, the, literally the first thing I did when I found out that I was going to be the rules manager, I reached out to Jamie, my second command for Anchor, and I said, Jamie, you're on my team. <laughs> um, so both of the, both of the two heads of Anchor are on Nisei, and we're absorbing them. So, uh, Netrunner rule and our rules wiki on Twitter is going to be the go-to source for, you know, old cards and new cards alike. Great, so and I'll really and I'll put um, like I did with the other videos. Everybody watching, I will put uh, once everything uploads, I'll put the links to uh, the Twitter for the rules wiki and mm-hmm. Nisei in the show notes, so people can take a look. Awesome. Yeah. And the only other thing I'll say is that, uh, you know, the 20 seconds when the license expires. So I would definitely expect the announcement at 26 to be pretty big news. Nice. And everybody, if you go on stimhack.com and you search for the author Nisei, you can very neatly, and there's a link to that in the show notes, um, you can Mm -hmm. see very neatly all of the announcements that Nisei's ever made all collected in one place. Yep. And on the stimhack forums as well there's a nisei discussion topic that has them all there too so it's super easy to find perfect um yeah we try to get the message out there as much as we can so stay tuned awesome well jacob thank you so much for coming on the show it was absolutely a pleasure to have you on yeah it was 
as always, you're awesome. Well, I, pre uh, I appreciate that. And I really, I really can't stress this enough. The work that you have done in the past and are continuing to do has been very integral to this game's success. So I really appreciate the work that you do. Thanks. That, that really means a lot. Everybody, take a look at the links in the show notes. If you have any follow-up questions, put them in the comments to the video. I am, I'll be more than happy to check them. And until we see you beautiful people again, always be running. Thanks for